The engines on the A6C7 have become even hotter, the number of plastic fittings has increased, as well as the amount of plastic in the engine compartment. At the same time, the package of radiators here is very dense, the fans on all engines are only electric with a switching threshold of 100 degrees. As a result, the degradation of plastic goes quite quickly, and after many works on machines at the age of literally five years, you will have to change a bunch of expensive nozzles or restore them collectively farm. For some reason, they put a bag of silica gel into the expansion tank, and after the same five years of operation, the bag spreads and pollutes the system with spent capsules. This is fraught with a clogged stove radiator and box heat exchanger and failure of the automatic transmission due to overheating. And also early failure of the pump. This is especially unpleasant in the case of 2 liter diesel engines of the EA288 series. There is an expensive pump with a complex shutdown drive. The basic gasoline engines of the EA888 family can be found on the car in two generations. The first includes 2 liter engines of the CAEB, 211 horsepower, CDNB, 180 horsepower, and CAED, 220 horsepower, series. The second CYPA, CYNB, CYPB, 240-252 HP, and 1.8 liter engines of the CYGA series, 190 horsepower. These are four-cylinder engines in a cast iron block with turbocharging and direct injection, with chain timing and obligatory balance shafts in the block. It is very easy to distinguish one generation from another visually. The third generation has two-phase regulators, and even if the power is indicated in the PTS incorrectly, the difference is immediately visible. In fact, there are many more external differences, but this is the most obvious. I already wrote a whole big article about these motors, but this is the most common series of engines on this generation of A6, and therefore I will give them additional attention. Motors are complex, and all weak points show themselves one way or another. EA888 Gen 2 was put on the A6 until restyling. Basically, there are 211 horsepower engines with a KKK03 turbine, an AVS, Audi valve lift system, variable valve timing system, and Hitachi TNDV. With oil appetite in this line of engines, the manufacturer quite successfully fought up to restyling. After about 2013, the motors no longer had a Frank oil burner, the replacement of the piston group and the modernization of the VCG helped, but for earlier versions and for engines operated with long oil change intervals in urban mode, oil will be consumed after overheating. And other shortcomings have not gone away. A very unstable timing resource, frank problems with balancer shafts and front support, with coking of intake valves, and similar trifles. In perfect condition, these engines do not come across as often as we would like, and they often say something like, this is a turbo, they should use oil. Fortunately, this is not the case. A serviceable motor of this generation with a new piston does not consume oil. Another common problem with these engines is pump leaks. Warping of the plastic part of the case or even the appearance of cracks on it is very common, and in this case it is recommended to replace the pump with a modified one, with the letter P in the part code, or non-original metal one, they are on sale. In general, the motor is not bad in terms of characteristics, but in operation it proves to be quite troublesome. He often needs a comprehensive repair with the elimination of all shortcomings, with the installation of a new type of piston group, refinement of the timing and VKG. Attempts to fix problems one at a time usually lead to prolonged agony, often ending with a timing chain jump due to balancer failures or major repairs due to a raised camshaft bearing or shaft beds. Such work, due to the mass nature of the motors, is done on the fly although in any case they required both time and money. After restyling, the car received EA888 Gen 3 generation engines and two displacement options. These engines have been significantly improved. They have a lighter cylinder block, thinner crankshaft journals, they have a new design adjustable oil pump, the exhaust manifold is integrated into the cylinder head, IHI turbines, and new fuel equipment with combined injection are installed. In general, this is a much more successful version of the engine. Here several important shortcomings of the previous generation of these motors are eliminated at once. 
The new bearing mounted balance shafts have no lubrication problems and act as a separator filter in the VCG system, significantly reducing intake oil and extending oil life. The timing resource has increased significantly due to the absence of problems with the balance shafts and the modernization of all other components. There is no problem with intake coking. Catalysts work much longer due to the better operation of engines during warm-up and a reduction in warm-up time in principle. There is actually only one minus in comparison with the previous generation due to the use of low viscosity oils and a decrease in oil pressure due to the new adjustable oil pump. Cases of crankshaft liner scuffing have become more frequent and scuffing of the bearings and camshaft beds has become massive. Fortunately, this problem is cured by just using more viscous oils in the summer, at least SAE 30 instead of the recommended SAE 20, although more viscous ones are recommended during tuning by turning off the first stage of the oil pump programmatically or by turning off the pressure sensor on the pump, after which it goes into emergency mode with maximum pressure. Provided that the timing is replaced with a mileage of 120 to 150,000 and a good choice of oil, such an engine causes much less trouble than the EA888 Gen 2. Of course, while the runs of these units are still mostly small, but we can already conclude that the EA888 Gen 3 is much better than the second generation of this series. And when choosing a car with a 2.0 TSI engine before and after restyling, the choice is clear. Cars with a 2.8 FSI engine with the code CHVA or later CVPA related to the EA837 line come across surprisingly often. Buyers were sure that the naturally aspirated V6 was more reliable than supercharged engines. Unfortunately, the expectations were not met. The aluminum cylinder block turned out to be prone to scuffing in case of any problems with the fuel equipment and even on the second generation of engines, which was installed on the C7 generation, it did not shine with reliability. And cold start was still a problem. Gasoline significantly blurred the oil film at temperatures below minus 20 degrees. The catalyst was also not happy. It failed and began to crumble early. As a result, massive badass blocks. They tried to solve the problem by lowering the operating temperature and replacing the thermostat during the warranty period. It did not help much, overheating with detonation and pouring nozzles are only part of the causes of scuffing. Inlet valve coking, valve seal leaks, carbon deposits in the combustion chamber, detonation due to timing disturbances still remained. The only way to fix the problem was to replace the block or replace it with a sleeve. However, many owners still drive crank blocks with knocking pistons and consider oil consumption and knocking to be the norm. Bullies are only half of all the problems with this line. On EA837 motors, a very complex timing chain mechanism with an AVS system and an arrangement of chains and phase regulators on the flywheel side. Moreover, there are four chains, and the system of dampers and tensioners would be more suitable for a museum exhibit and not for a serial motor. Chain knocks and even slips are already found at runs over 100,000, despite all the improvements in the mechanism. When the mileage is closer to 200,000, the chains must be changed. This operation is extremely expensive, requiring the removal of the gearbox, or better, the removal of the motor, since with such a run it usually needs to be completely resealed, or even overhauled. The AVS system does not cause much trouble. Its components work reliably up to at least 200,000. Nevertheless, it is complicated, and when repairing motors, this increases both the price of work and the possibility of a locksmith's error. In addition, the cylinder head lubrication system is implemented through a 2 mm hole under the chain tensioner block, and this hole sometimes becomes clogged. As a result, the cylinder head is sent for repair, and the camshafts have to be changed. You can buy a car with a 2.8 liter engine only after endoscopy of the cylinders. If the motor is lined with cast iron, then this is a fairly good option, albeit not the cheapest to operate. The 3.0 TFSI engines, despite all the similar characteristics, belong to different generations. 
engine CGWB, CGXB, CGWD, and CTUA with a power of 300 to 333 horsepower, belong to the EA837 generation, as well as 2.8 liter engines, and the engines of the CREC slash CREH models after 2014 of the same power belong to the EA837 EVO line, which has been significantly modified. And although the characteristics of the motors are very similar, but in operation they are completely different. These are six-cylinder V engines with a volume of three liters and an aluminum block with a compressor and a liquid intercooler. And, of course, with direct injection. For engines of the EA837 line, scuffing is as typical as for engines with a volume of 2.8 liters. The reasons are generally exactly the same. An aluminum block, high temperatures, detonation, a dusty catalyst, constant waste of oil from the VKG and seals due to the rapid aging of all rubber elements, and an extremely unsuccessful implementation of the direct injection system. According to the revocable company, the motors changed the thermostat to a colder one and were strongly advised to reduce oil change intervals. They even changed the firmware, but the engine never became reliable. In addition to the main problems, there were complaints about the clutch in the Eaton compressor drive and the wear of the compressor screws due to bearing failure at high mileage. There were also problems with failures of the electric intercooler pump. But all this is generally less significant than timing and badass. Buying a car with such an engine is highly discouraged, it is expensive and extremely troublesome. Moreover, it will be cheaper to buy a car with an already modified engine of the EA837 EVO family. Six months before the restyling of the model, 3.0 TFSI motors were replaced with a new line of EA837 EVO. Outwardly, the motors are very similar, their technical characteristics are the same, but the design differences are enormous. For starters, new motors from the factory have thin-walled cast iron liners. And even though the piston group was lightened, the motors have no problems with scuffing. They occur only in rare cases when the fuel equipment fails or when overheating occurs. Here they changed the oil scraper rings, the former one still had a tendency to coking. On the motor, the timing was seriously modified, improving dampers, chains, and tensioners. The injection system has become combined. In addition to direct injection nozzles, nozzles appeared in the intake manifold. This immediately solved the problems of valve coking, cold start and warm up at low temperatures. The new direct injection nozzles have become much more reliable, they still do not leak, while in the first generation the nozzles were changed even under warranty. To reduce fuel consumption, the compressor was made switchable at low load. They introduced phase regulators on the exhaust shafts, finalized the VCG, installed a pump with variable performance and reconfigured the motor as a whole. As a result, bullies are a thing of the past, the timing resource has become much more stable, and chain jumps with runs up to 150,000 are completely a thing of the past. True, records for the chain resource are still not beaten, but with quiet operation, you can count on 200,000. And in general, the engine has become better and more reliable. Bringing the past generation to this level is almost unrealistic. Even after lining the block and replacing the piston, there will still be many weak points that are eliminated only by purchasing newer components from the EVO motor. And as a nice bonus, the EA837 EVO has an excellent boost margin from the standard 300 horsepower to over 500 with a modest investment. Of course, we should not forget that this is still a complex and expensive engine to operate, requiring professional and frequent maintenance. It will never be cheap to operate, but for a premium car it is a relatively practical option. Motors 4.0 TSI, 420-450 HP, on the S6 are coded CEUC or CTGE, and 560 horsepower on the RS6 CRDB and CWUC. They belong to the EA824 Gen 3 family. These motors with an aluminum block are very similar to the engines of the EA837 line, but with modified timing and fuel equipment. They do not have versions with factory cast iron liners, but many motors are lined in preparation for serious tuning. 
the main advantage from the point of view of potential owners is the highest potential of the block, crankshaft, connecting rods, and control system. Tuning over 700 forces, even on a regular aluminum block, is non-lethal for them. You can remove even more than 1,200 horsepower, but bullying is possible here too. The motors are distinguished by a not very successful timing design and a very small oil supply channel in the cylinder head. However, usually they do not save on the operation of such motors, and the machine reciprocates. Taking a car with such an engine on the secondary for everyday use after the racers is fraught with high costs, but if the goal is to get something of the 500 horsepower class, then this is a reasonable option. This engine is one of the best in its class. With diesel engines, everything is a little simpler in the sense that they are very widely represented on other cars of the company. Diesel 2-liter engines of the EA189 and EA288 lines are one of the most reliable engines of the concern at the moment. But it is worth remembering that the firmware on the EA189 was changed after the diesel gate, and in terms of dynamics and consumption, they changed not for the better. The EA288 is a little stifled from the very beginning, but it has a complex dual-circuit cooling system with a switchable pump, due to which it warms up quickly and is distinguished by very soft operation. Diesel 3-liter engines of the EA897 and EA897 EVO series are very similar to the units of the second-generation EA896 line, which I already considered in the VW Touareg review. The motors of the EA897 line are distinguished by the new Bosch fuel equipment with piezo injectors and only two circuits instead of four. Here the EGR and the entire intake as a whole have been updated. On the motors, a separate belt for driving the injection pump was removed, and now it is driven by the same chain as the vacuum and oil pumps. On diesel engines of this line, a diesel oxidizing converter and a particulate filter were used. It is a pity that the intake of gases into the EGR system was made before the soot and not after, which could solve the problem with intake pollution. The options that meet the negative 6 euro standard also have a urea neutralization system, but we have not officially sold such cars. The 313 horsepower version of the diesel, engine code CGQB, has an extremely complex double supercharging unit, but otherwise it is the same good old 3 liter diesel engines as before, only more reliable and economical. With good maintenance, they do not sin with frequent breakdowns and delight with phenomenal efficiency. But the engines of the new 897 EVO line that appeared at the end of 2015 are no longer so unambiguously good. A small change in the form of installing an oil pump separately, with a separate chain drive, after three or four years, can lead to serious damage. The oil pump itself and its drive turned out to be unreliable, and by mileage of 80 to 100,000, the engine may be left without oil pressure. There is no need to wait for other major troubles from him yet. The statistics of oil pump failures are still too small to say how common the problem is, but due to the severity of the consequences, it is worth being suspicious of any extraneous noise and checking the condition of the engine oil for chips. The brakes of the A6C7 really don't offer any surprises. With discs of 320 and 345 millimeters, there are single piston calipers, as simple and reliable as possible. These were installed on all cars with four-cylinder engines and on the weakest versions with V6 engines, petrol 2.8 FSI and diesel 3.0 TDI. Even on cars in versions with a 3.0 TFSI engine, S6 versions, and with a 333 horsepower diesel engine with 356 mm discs, two piston calipers with a floating bracket were installed, of a fairly simple design and with quite reasonable prices for all components. There are no particular problems with the resource either. It can be noted that large discs tend to buckle when hit in puddles, but this is common to almost all brakes of this size. Non-original ceramic discs do not exist in nature, and simple non-original cast iron discs are more expensive than the original. In general, the brakes on the RS6 are expensive, and there are no loopholes to cut costs on them. On the rear axle, ventilated disc brakes for all versions with disc diameters from 300 to 356 millimeters. 
The parking brake mechanism is implemented using an electric drive with a gear motor on the caliper itself. The system works quite reliably, and the high price of the original mechanism is offset by low chances of failure and the presence of inexpensive non-original elements. Well, the RS6 may also have ceramics on the rear axle with a diameter of 370 mm, otherwise the caliper differs only in size. It is too early to expect breakdowns of hoses, tubes, sensors, or the ABS units themselves. Even in cars before styling, these brake elements are usually fine. The suspension design has not changed fundamentally in comparison with previous generations. The front suspension has a proprietary multi-link, the rear suspension is also multi-link, but quite typical for this class. Many people have heard that these Audi suspensions are expensive and break, but in practice they have a very good service life. True, there is one nuance. The front suspension on the C7 is completely new, all elements have been replaced. On the previous generation, all levers, except for the suspension trunnion, which is individual for each model and configuration, were interchangeable with the suspension arms of the 1994 model. The only thing that changed was the diameter of the ball joint pin of the direct lever. The suspension was brought to mind, but the appearance of new parts in the C7 generation led to the emergence of new childhood diseases. The factory version of the suspension began to knock to a run of about 40,000. It knocked slightly, but in a quiet cabin it was very annoying. In this case, under warranty, the anti-roll bar rods were replaced with metal ones, which helped very rarely, and the silent block of the crooked lower arm with a reinforced 14H04071A3B from the heavier A8. The straight lever was either changed as an assembly, or in case of wear of the silent blocks, only they were changed. After these manipulations, the knock usually did not bother the owners for a long time, but it should be noted that in winter the new reinforced silent block worked out the bumps hard. With anywhere on the stabilizer struts or steering tips, this gave rise to a slight tapping and, as a result, further troubleshooting. These problems were especially noticeable on low-profile wide tires with hard rolling. In general, this is where the typical problems end. If the owner has a bit of healthy indifference and does not look for problems where there are none, then the suspension resource can be considered outstanding. In Moscow, many people reach 150 to 200,000 mileage without replacing levers and silent blocks. But this is only possible if the springs have not yet sagged. And this happens quite often, they do not have a safety margin, so gradual subsidence and even broken coils with runs over 150,000 kilometers are not uncommon. But the shock absorber life of the A6C7 is surprisingly high. As an option, the car could have air suspension. It is quite reliable, and most cars do not have serious problems with it, and only instances of the first years of production slowly begin to have problems with leaks and with the compressor resource. Most air suspension problems are leaks at the receiver fittings, body position sensor failures, a freezing valve block, and less commonly, compressor wear. The racks of this generation themselves can withstand quite reliably 150 or even more thousand kilometers. Even cars in commercial use with runs over 300,000 can still have original parts. However, in case of breakdowns, one must be prepared for the fact that a quick repair will be expensive. Original racks will cost from 160,000, and if you take it directly from the manufacturer, then 40,000 are cheaper. And there are no substitutes for them. Both struts and shock absorbers can be given for restoration. In the event of a compressor breakdown, in most cases, you can get by with replacing the working group, which even the Chinese do. In general, the pneumatics on the C7 is no different from any other. It is still quite reliable, but the chances of getting into expensive repairs are growing every day. It should be noted that the car did not have the strongest wheel bearings, which last less than other suspension elements. After 100,000 mileage, increased noise may indicate that it is time to buy new hubs. There are no difficulties with replacement, but the spare parts themselves are a bit expensive. The bearing comes only assembled with the hub. It is especially unpleasant that most often the rear bearings fail, which cost twice as much as the front bearings in a non-original version. 
The steering on the A6C7 is always with an electric rack, but in two versions, in the form of a regular rack and in the form of an active one. However, they have common problems. The main one is the not very successful rack boots. Over time, the crack in water begins to penetrate inside. There is very little lubricant there, and corrosion not only quickly kills the shaft with the electric motor, but also spoils the electronic components. The control unit connectors are especially affected, and sometimes the unit itself fails. Sometimes you can encounter malfunctions in the form of a flashed firmware or a biting steering column cardan, but all this is treated much cheaper than a rail killed by water. There are no serious breakdowns with regular motors in the transmission of the Audi A6 C7. CV joints and gearboxes last a long time. The rear gearbox and cardan shafts of all-wheel drive versions are also extremely reliable. Their resource is limited only for powerful S6 and RS6. The only weak point is the CV joint cover of the cardan shaft, which dries out and cracks after five years of operation. It is better to monitor its condition because there is no separate hinge for sale, and if it fails, then replacing it simply and quickly will not work. It is difficult to find an A6 with manual transmission, but the boxes of the 0B1 and 0CS series themselves do not cause serious problems. You just have to be prepared for the fact that dual mass flywheels have a very limited service life and the price of these parts is high. There are many automatic transmissions on the A6, depending on the type of drive, power, and year of manufacture, one of four automatic transmissions could be installed. Before restyling, front-wheel drive cars were equipped with a second-generation CVT manufactured by Audi of the 0AW-VL381 series. Before restyling, most all-wheel drive cars received a 7-speed preselective DSG Series 0B5, aka DL501, as automatic transmissions. After restyling, the variator on front-wheel drive cars and on all-wheel drive cars with four-cylinder engines was replaced with a 7-speed DSG of the DL382-7F series. Well, the most powerful versions with engines with a torque of more than 500 newton meters relied on an 8-speed ZF automatic transmission of the 0BK series, aka 8HP55AF. The same box can be found with any motors on machines for regional markets outside of Europe. In particular, cars from the USA were equipped with it even with 2.0 TSI engines. Since in Russia most of the cars are dealerships, finding such an option is simply unrealistic. Contrary to the popular belief that CVTs are something fragile and weak, the VL381 unit turned out to be a very reliable thing. It is designed for motors with a torque of up to 380 newton meters, and its design is very well designed. The main problems with the box arise from gross non-compliance with operating conditions, and among the failures, only the failure of the rotor speed sensor G195 is noted as typical. True, to repair the sensor you will have to open the control unit and unsolder the sensor, but this is a well-mastered operation. The block also contains two oil pressure sensors and an input shaft speed sensor, but they rarely fail. Typical mistakes that owners of cars with this variator make are rarely changing the oil and towing a car with a non-working engine. The first leads to rapid failure of solenoids, bearings, and the starting clutch pack. The second leads to the wedge of the starting pack and scuffing of the working surface of the cones. The transmission handles overload quite easily, and scuffing due to cold overload or torsional vibrations is rare. At first glance, the design differs little from the first generation of Audi CVTs. This one is also chain, and it uses a starter clutch package, not a gas turbine engine. But in fact, almost all the elements here are new. The main weaknesses of the first generation in the form of an unsuccessful control unit and a starter pack lubrication system prone to failure with an ejection pump have been significantly improved. And to increase the transmitted moment and resource, the surface of the cones was finalized and the work algorithms were optimized. The gear ratio of the variator at light load still changes smoothly, but as the load increases, the chain moves into the position of one of eight fixed gears, and the maximum transmitted torque can only be achieved in this position. When operating at maximum torque, 
the gear ratio does not change. To switch the zone, the motor thrust is reduced. The surface of the cones has a slightly more complex profile, optimized for this type of load variation. This made it possible to increase the guaranteed life of the chain to approximately 200,000 mileage, and with gentle operation, it can withstand more than 350,000. So on this variator it can be considered eternal, and most breakdowns occur due to malfunctions of the lubrication system and failures of the speed sensors. At the same time, overheating often causes a problem with the sensor and wear of the starter pack. The standard oil heat exchanger on the box at runs of 150 to 200,000 is often clogged, and the temperature of the oil in the box begins to rise. With its regular increase to 120 degrees, problems begin with the ejection pump and the control unit. It's funny that the situation is often saved by another malfunction. The fact is that a thermostat is located in the antifreeze supply pipe of the heat exchanger, which prevents the supply of antifreeze until the engine is completely warmed up. The heat capacity of the box is quite large, and its heating in a mild climate is not so important. After three years of operation, the thermostat turns sour and most often in the open position. In general, it is recommended to remove the thermostat so that the variator warms up at least a little in cold weather immediately and its temperature does not rise above the temperature of the motor, but here everything is going relatively well. The only bad thing is that 2-liter gasoline engines and especially diesel engines with a constantly open automatic transmission cooling circuit warm up much longer instead of 5 to 8 minutes, all 20, even under load. The 7-speed DSG box of the DL501 series by the time it was installed on the A6 in the back of the C7 was already out of its childish age, and its main problems were eliminated. She received a built-in fine filter for the hydraulic part, improved mechatronics, and a sensor unit. In the mechanical part of the improvements, more durable bearings and a reinforced housing at the output of the drives can be noted in early variators, the bearing seat was broken. The average resource of clutch packs has grown to 120,000, and the maximum could have been all 250. The earliest versions of the box could have relatively weak mechatronics blocks, where the printed circuit board failed due to temperatures and vibrations. This led to the failure of the clutch system sensors. Unfortunately, sufficiently high loads and the recommended oil change schedule lead to the fact that dirty oil and fouling of the heat exchanger lead to temperature increase and failures over time. In the case of gasoline engines, the oil change interval in hydraulics is highly recommended to be reduced to 30 to 40,000 mileage, and in the mechanical part it can be changed at least once every 60,000. When changing the oil, it is imperative to change both filters, internal in the sump and fine filter. On the earliest versions of the box, an external fine filter unit could be used. In case of mechatronics failures, the clutch package suffers first of all, there are usually no problems with forks. In general, this box with proper maintenance is very reliable. But if it was serviced not quite competently, the need for repair may arise with runs from 150,000 kilometers. But, as is the case with other DSG boxes, checking with a scanner allows you to identify almost all possible problems. The DL382 boxes that appeared after restyling differ significantly in design. They have a very lightweight mechanical part and a completely different mechatronics unit. And, fundamentally, they have an electric oil pump instead of a mechanical one, and sometimes there are problems with oil pressure due to oil breakdowns, sensor errors, or hydraulic accumulator failure. The main problem, oddly enough, arises in mechanics. With a rear oil change or the appearance of vibrations, a weak input shaft bearing dies from a dual-mass flywheel, and front-wheel drive vehicles also have very weak differential bearings. The electronics in the box is also not perfect. Failures occur regularly, but the unit is repaired relatively inexpensively, and if the mechatronics did not kill the clutch package, then the repair will not be ruinous. Most of the problems with mechatronics are caused by overheating the box requires a rework of the cooling system. The standard cooling system with gasoline engines warms up the oil to 120 degrees, and with diesel engines the box temperature rarely rises above 90, so there are much fewer problems on diesel cars. Another problem with these boxes is the maintenance schedule. 
it does not provide for an oil change procedure, and failures of the oil pump and mechatronics with runs over 120,000, according to the service, are often caused by its contamination. Unfortunately, the new box is significantly less reliable than the DL501 and is noticeably more expensive to repair and replace. Its diagnosis should be approached much more carefully. And, of course, in addition to diagnostics with a scanner, it is worth checking the operation of the automatic transmission both on a cold one and after a full warm-up. The 8-speed ZF gearbox is found in our country only in tandem with very torque motors and is extremely rare. It is completely useless to judge its resource using the S6 as an example, but some conclusions can be drawn from the example of other cars. In general, this is a successful unit, but a good resource in normal driving mode is combined with reduced foolproofness during annealing. Those modes that were well tolerated by the 6-speed ZF, the new boxes are much worse. Drift and constant starts on the floor with smoke, this is not for her. There is a noticeably weaker mechanical part, so the chances of damaging the drums are higher. Yes, and the gas turbine engine fails easily during overloads. If you buy an American with this box and a 2-liter engine, then there are high chances that before the first repair it will pass more than 250,000 even without a timely oil change. In any case, overseas it is highly praised. On this generation, all-wheel drive in cars is only the classic Quattro with a torsion center differential in the center. On the next generation, they began to install Ultra, but on the C7, even after restyling, there are no such gifts. There are no questions about the reliability of the drive. Some breakdowns are possible only with runs over 400,000 and with the most powerful engines. True, rear-wheel drive can be cut off on the RS6, but such problems are unlikely to concern normal drivers. If you carefully read the introductory part, the one in which I talked about body materials, you will immediately understand that you can only look for rust on a couple of panels from the outside. And you need to look for it there because the rear fenders and the roof of the car sometimes delight the owners with rust spots. And, what is unpleasant, it does not depend on the age of the car. Instances after restyling in the same way can have damage to the paintwork on the arches and the leading edge of the roof, like cars of the first years of production. True, in early cars, the damage area on the rear arch can be much larger, and the damage itself does not remain in the form of small chips and swellings along the edge of the arch but spreads under the rear fender and under the sill. On the roof, only the edge above the glass suffers because Audi decided not to spend money on molding. And it's good that there is a solid roof sheet without grooves and recesses that would suffer due to violations of the tightness of the seams. Aluminum panels suffer minimally from corrosion, but still gray spots near the door handles, on the bottoms of the doors, on the arches of the front fenders, above the license plate hood and along the edge of the hood this, in fact, is aluminum corrosion. It arises mainly due to the use of unsuitable detergents or simply a complete reluctance to service the paintwork. In addition, the gaps between the panels are minimal, and in the event of ice formation, the edges of the panels are not only scratched, but also crumpled. Otherwise, some problems with the body are associated solely with the consequences of an accident. Aluminum panels are thin and dent very easily, and restoration without painting helps them much worse than in the case of steel parts. Unsuccessful painting in the case of aluminum is not only very weak adhesion, but also interesting processes with swelling of the soil layer and similar troubles. Aluminum still requires a far more skilled painter than is usually the case. Since the base of the body is steel, there are no two unexpected surprises here. Like all modern VAG cars with thin paintwork, the brand new A6 is gradually rusting. Already on 5-year-old cars you can find points of corrosion on the arches, and if you remove the rear arch lockers and underbody panels, you will be surprised at the amount of rust found. The situation will be better in the front arches, there is an aluminum cup, and the steel spar is covered with a layer of sealant at the joint. A small dirt pocket in the rear of the arch does not cause any particular problems yet, but over time the lower wing mount may deteriorate. In the rear arches, things are noticeably worse. The inner rolling of the arch is rusting, and in its upper part there are pneumatic tubes and wiring to control shock absorbers. Behind them, 
There are usually also pockets of corrosion on the inner mudguard. There are almost certainly red marks next to the shock absorber support seams. Rust is usually shallow, for which thanks to galvanization, but it is already there. The reason for its occurrence is that the locker here is felt. It dampens noise very well, but in the conditions of Moscow, St. Petersburg, or any major northern city, the locker will be constantly wet from autumn to summer. There is a similar problem with the bottom panels, which are made of a fibrous material similar to felt. Noise isolation with him is good, but the steel panels of the bottom have a hard time. The panels are not covered with bituminous compounds, and only a small layer of sealant protects them. All non-ventilated recesses, especially those where something is located, for example, next to the fuel tank, filter, behind the protection of the fuel and brake lines, rust very intensively. There is already quite a lot of rust on five-year-old machines of ordinary street storage. Of course, this is just unpleasant, but the holes are still very far away. Unfortunately, cleaning the bottom is long and expensive, and in most cases the owner will not bother with it. A simple spill with a preservative composition, most likely, will not help, and besides, the aluminum car syndrome works, the owners fundamentally ignore the anti-corrosive agent as is the case with Land Rover, for example. And we are sure that if there is aluminum on the outside of the body, then nothing bad will happen to the car. Since when buying you are unlikely to be allowed to disassemble all the bottom panels, just inspect the spare wheel niche from the outside. It is usually in slightly better condition than the bottom panels covered with felt. It does not hurt to check the plums of the engine niche. They traditionally for Audi have a tendency to clog, which is not very bad for the body, but unpleasant for the electronics and interior. The A6C7 usually does not have water in the trunk niches, but it does not hurt to check this place. I must say right away, the main complaint of all owners of the A6 does not relate to the quality of the equipment, but to the cost of parts. But constructive punctures can still be found. So, it is very easy to damage the headlights, just slam the hood harder, and the optics can lose their tightness. What to do, the gaps are scanty, and the hood buffers are soft. The factory hood hinges are very delicate, and the Chinese hinges are designed for a completely different hood Chinese, with a different distance between the attachment points. The handles of the keyless entry system can be considered expenditure, and the GPS antenna on the roof also dies over time. Outside rear view mirrors very rarely have problems with photochromic and very often with the folding mechanism, they turn inside out. The trunk open button with runs over 100,000 often depressurizes and fails. Optics is a separate headache for owners. The simplest one fails simply and boringly, the headlights suffer from sandblasting, the lens burns out. But since there are regular daytime running lights, after five years of operation, the lenses can still be quite working. But the Garland DRL sometimes goes out. Water and oxidized power boards are regularly found in the taillights of sedans. Usually there is nothing to repair, the lamp has to be changed. On restyling appeared matrix LED headlights. Here the fan fails, the controller dies if water gets in, and the LEDs fail, usually in summer. In general, these headlights shine great, but if the car is older than 5 years, it will often be cheaper to rebuild the engine than to restore the headlight. By the way, their light itself is weaker than that of ordinary xenon, so in our conditions matrix light does not always have a clear advantage over ordinary non-intelligent light. Keep in mind that equipping machines in general is very expensive. All-round cameras, a motorized trunk drive, a removable tow bar, parking sensors, active radiator shutters, and many other components are expensive here. In general, at the moment there are no mass failures, but any traces of body repairs should lead you to think about a thorough check of all systems, because restoring a slightly scratched car at auction shows that the price of body work is often less than the purchase price even used set of damaged electronics. Otherwise, no special problems have been noticed with the car so far. Still, the average age does not even reach 10 years, and German quality in the case of Audi is not an empty phrase. The interior of the A6 is excellent, and the C7 generation is well equipped with all the new technologies. 
the MMI Touch slash MIB2 screen, digital tidy were organically integrated into it. All this was supplemented with a multi-zone climate and all the features of a modern premium. And yes, there is more space here than in the long wheelbase A8 of the first generation. The quality of the finish is beyond praise, but there are some nuances. For example, plating looks great, but a thin layer of foil lags behind the surface. The problem is especially relevant in the frame of door cards, where chrome is touched by hands and where water often gets on it. And on most machines, the plug of the backlight brightness adjustment knob is lost. If the owner did not ride with rings or claws and did not weigh more than 120 kilograms, then the seats and steering wheel hold up to at least 200,000 mileage. Moreover, the texture of the steering wheel here from the factory is very smooth, so the mileage is felt rather weakly. True, the owners of the previous generation note that the materials have become more tarpaulin, but in general this is not very noticeable against the background of classmates. Of the important features of the body, it should be noted that the rear seat on sedans does not fold, and the hatch for transporting long items on the A6 from the previous generation was an option, that is, not on all cars. Surprisingly, with mileages just above 100,000 kilometers, problems regularly arise with the heater fan bearings. Ball bearings, sealed, but do not withstand our dust. Replacing them is not very difficult, but many people, to increase the life of the fan, install a pre-filter for the climate system to reduce contamination of the fan cavity. The system with a panoramic sunroof is superbly whimsical. Its breakdowns are much more common than in cars with a conventional sunroof. And, what is unpleasant, often everything ends with flooded interior floors. In climate control, the main problem is failure of dampers, which is usually treated by adaptation and sometimes by replacement. There are practically no problems with the air conditioner and the stove. Here, except that quick detachable antifreeze supplies are prone to leaks. However, like the entire cooling system, beyond the scope of a brief story, you will have to leave a description of the capabilities of the dashboard, multimedia system, and various options for failures of onboard systems, which indirectly relate to interior systems. Displays, buttons, switches, touchpad, touch interface form a whole ecosystem with very complex connections and rich options for settings, updates, as well as glitches and breakdowns. The possibilities of customizing the car are slightly out of the scope of the story. In short, you can put a colored dashboard, illuminated door panels, and a central tunnel, several seat options, you can choose dozens of trim options, several steering wheel options, and so on. In a word, the interior of the A6C7, like its electronics, is a real designer for people with imagination. The component protection system was introduced in the last generation A6, and this is a very important factor in increasing the cost of maintenance. Let me remind you of the essence of the system. The blocks are tied to each other, and you can change the block to a used one only by untying it from the dealer. Despite all the reliability and stability of the onboard electronics of cars of this generation, the need to replace units still sometimes arises. There are a lot of blocks here, more than 30, and almost half of them are protected by components. The units themselves are more reliable than those of the C6 generation, but there are still chances of getting stuck with a non-working machine in the wilderness where there is no specialist. And you will have to get to the dealer on a tow truck. On the other hand, there is a very reliable immobilizer. There are no problems with the steering column block or other units that could potentially prevent the engine from starting. Of the real breakdowns, we can note the unsuccessful braid of the front parking sensors, which has a couple of problem areas, a delicate corrugation in the trunk wiring and leaks in many external units, from the antenna to the parking sensors and door handles. Let me remind you once again about the headlights and the trunk button, after which it will become clear that the operation of the A6 in rainy regions was clearly not intended.